Today's sermon's entitled, Enter His Gates with Thanksgiving in Our Hearts. My name's Reverend Derek Gilder. I'm a senior pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say thank you. You know what? It's almost wintertime, but so far we don't have any snow flying here in New Brunswick. So praise be to God. It's still amazing and awesome, and I even like the winter time. But for now, I rejoice in the fall time. You know what? Today I'm going to talk all about Thanksgiving. I'm going to talk about praise. It's from Psalms 100, and I hope that you get a lot out of this sermon because when I was preparing it, my goodness, God talked to me. Thanksgiving, I think, is a very special time of year. Living in North America, there are many reasons to count our blessings with a smile on our face and to have joy in our hearts. For most, Thanksgiving, I think, is a time to meet with family. And I think we have all-you-can-eat buffets of turkey and ham, potatoes and stuffing, and we smother that with a great big old mountain of gravy, with side dishes of cranberry sauce, corn, beans, pickles, and rolls, and we top all that off at the very end with a whole bunch of apple, lemon, cherry, and blueberry pies. We have a lot of food to eat this Thanksgiving, and if you're one of those fortunate people, you don't just have one meal to go to, you have several different meals. And if the food wasn't enough to be thankful for, think about all the family that you're going to get to meet this Thanksgiving. The people that you haven't seen during this year, maybe, and you get to spend time with them and you get to say, oh my goodness, I have missed you so very much. And you get to catch up on their lives. What about the hugs? Those wonderful hugs that we get from our family that just, they can give us hugs in a way that nobody else can. It is a time of great celebration. And I got thinking though, Should not Thanksgiving be far more than that? I got thinking, when we look upon this feast, can't we possibly stop and take a moment to say, you know what, God, you're good. You are far more than I could ever ask or imagine. I love the food. I love all the cranberry sauce and the turkey that you see in the picture. And I love potatoes and I love gravy and I love a whole bunch of desserts, Lord. But I love you more. I love you so very much more, Lord. Should that not be on our hearts and our minds? Yes, it is important to love our families. And yes, in North America especially, it is important to thank God for all the things that we have, for we have a true abundance. But isn't it also equally and more important, I would say, to actually take a breath and say, God, you are my creator and you are my redeemer. I have my existence because of you. And I thank you, Lord, that you love me. I think that, above all, we should do every single day of the year, especially on Thanksgiving. So this sermon is going to review four steps to giving grateful praise to God. Think about it. What do you give God on Thanksgiving? What do you say to Him? I mean, you can't necessarily buy Him any old gift because He's God. It says in Scriptures He doesn't need anything from us, so therefore, what do we actually get God that He's going to sit back and say, Yes, good and faithful servant, this is exactly what I wanted. And that is our praise, our love, our devotion. That's what God is looking for. In this sermon, we're going to find out that there's four particular ways the psalmist says to praise God. Number one, serve God with joy. Number two, know the Lord as our shepherd. Number three, enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. And number four, remember his love and his faithfulness endures for absolutely ever. Amen to that. That's awesome. God is so good. I got thinking about our different responses to God. And that's the first thing that Psalmist talks about. He says, ultimately, we as people of God are expected to serve God with joy. He created us in his image for that express purpose so that we could have a relationship with him. In the church, I played a music clip. Took me a while to actually develop this clip, but I had seven different songs. And I had a clip of 30 seconds for each different song. And I focused on seven different genres. For instance, the first song that I played was Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. 30 seconds of that. You know where he says, hey, teacher, leave these kids alone. I mean, what a beautiful song, eh? And it's like, wow, okay, I started with that one. And then I switched right into Hallelujah by uh, Kate Vogel. Another amazing song. And then right into Amazing Grace by Guy Penrod. You know, that's a classic that we all like to hear. And then I went from there to Nessun Dorma. And there was a girl, she was only 12 years old on America's Got Talent, and she, she sang this opera song, and it was absolutely stunning. And then I went to a country song, and it's called God's Country by Blake Shelton, and another amazing song. And then I went to The Thrill is Gone by B.B. King to get a little bit of that jazz, and then I finished with Living Well by Sigmund Regis, and that's a Christian heavy metal rock song. 
I had seven different genres. Now, to be honest, if you heard those songs today, right now, you'd probably sit back and say, well, Pastor, some of those I tapped my toe to, some of those I got excited about, some of those I was ready to jump up for joy and say, praise be to God. For other ones, not so much so. The Pink Floyd one's not a song about God at all. I didn't find that one very useful at all for me. And for some of the other songs, even though they'd mentioned God's name, I didn't like the genre. I didn't like the style of music. I didn't appreciate it whatsoever. I think the song in itself may be able to embody the soul with great delight for some people, but some songs, some genres or types of songs, they don't give us very much pleasure at all, even if the words are good. Now I want to talk about two different kinds of people, okay? I want to first talk about those people who do not love God, and then I want to talk about those people who do. So let's start off with the first group of individuals. While some of the songs were absolutely exciting, some were not. The same is true when we look at the kingdoms. Now, there are two kingdoms in this world when we talk about spiritual worlds. There is the kingdom of Satan, a kingdom that goes against everything that God says, and then there's the kingdom of God. And that is God's kingdom. And God makes it very clear in Scripture, you cannot serve both God and Satan at the same time. Either you have allegiance for the Lord Jesus Christ and you've given your heart to him and you say, praise be to God, I love him so dearly and he is my father and I am his child. Or you say, I'm in love with this world and I like doing whatever I want to do. You cannot have both, God says. You cannot say on the one hand, once in a while I'll serve you, God, just for fun, but the rest of the time, now nah, I think I'm going to do whatever I want. Thank you very much. That's a sign that you're not saved in the first place, according to Paul. He says, you know what, one of the most important factors we have is we must make Jesus the Lord of our lives to be saved in the first place. And I think that is true. When we hear a musical genre we do not like, what do we do? Turn the channel turn the station or turn it off and say, no, I'm not going to listen to that. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people in this world that when as soon as God comes on the scene, they either turn the channel or turn them off. They just stop listening to him. It's not like he's not there. He's indivisibly present everywhere. They just choose not to listen because they don't like his message. I think those who want to serve Satan ultimately have a really tough time, an impossible time, dare I say, accepting anything from God. For those who have given over to the reprobate minds, according to Romans 1.28, the mere thought of walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, living that life genre, so to speak, is absolutely repulsive to them, and they want to be like Pink Floyd and cry out, Hey, teacher! Leave those kids alone. Stop bothering them. Stop bothering me. I want to live my life the way I want to. And that's the response we get from so many people of this world. The spirit of this age, I think, is too much like Pharaoh who said, Who is God that I would ever follow him or obey him? Who is he anyway? They don't know who God is. Their love for the ways of this world has made the people at very best indifferent to God of this world. But at very worst, there are people of this world that hate God and don't want anything whatsoever to do with him. They do not want to bow their knee to him at all in any way, shape or form because they love the freedom of being on that broad path. You know, where they get to choose whatever they want to do. You know, some people in this world, they don't want to bow their knee to a teacher to tell them what to do, to a police officer to tell them what to do, to their parents to tell them what to do, and they certainly don't want God to tell them, oh, by the way, this is how you should live your life. So when God shows up on scene and he says, oh, by the way, to a non-Christian, I want to, you to know me, I already know you, but I want you to know me, to them, that's repulsive. They don't want to know. They don't like that genre. So they change the channel and they say, no, I'm too busy glorifying and honoring myself. Go away, God. Just like this guy in the picture. He's got his hand up in the air. God, not here. Go away. That's the first response we have to God. Their genre is a genre of let me do whatever I want. Now, let's switch our feet just here very quickly. And we're going to go to scripture. For the Christian, the genre that we love the most should be and ought to be, if we are a Christian, to love God with all our heart. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Psalms 1 and uh, verse 2. 
I got thinking about our praise. You know, in sharp contrast, the unbeliever serving the Lord is a delightful sonnet to the Christian. When Jesus shows up and says, oh, by the way, I want your allegiance. I want you to serve me. I want to spend time with you. I want to tell you about God the Father in heaven. I want to teach you my ways. I want to teach you how to be holy. I want to give you my commands. What do we say? Yes, Lord, I'm all in. Like this guy in the picture, of course, Lord, I'm in. I want to know you, Lord. And you are my delight. You are my portion. I want to know you. I have your spirit living inside of me. I have the mind of Christ. And when you say those words, obey me, that's sweet aroma to me. When we think about worship, we tend to think about singing the songs of praise. And when we read our Bible, we tend to think about that as worship. But the psalmist here wants to go way beyond that. And he says, oh, by the way, God wants the kind of service that honors him by becoming living sacrifices. Paul says that to the church of Rome. He says, oh, by the way, your life should be one in which you sacrifice your freedom to choose whatever you want to do. And you say, Lord, here I am. Take me, whatever you want me to do, Lord. I'm all in because I love you. And I know you love me, Lord. And I know whatever you want me to do, that is for my good and I want to do it. This means that the words that are read or sung, or sung concerning God. I think they're done with great joy and great gratitude that's so intent that our heart submits to the Lord Jesus Christ and we can't help but cry out and say, whatever the decisions are in my life, Lord, you take the wheel. You take the wheel. I want you to lead because I love you. Those who come into the presence of God shout out their allegiance and celebrate the grace they have received. They're not timid. They're not lukewarm pretenders of the faith. We are ambassadors and royal priests of the Most High God, and as such, we will not allow anyone or anything to stand between us and God. We love Him. Especially, I would like to think, on Thanksgiving. We want to cry out to the world, I found this beautiful treasure in the field. I found this pearl that's worth infinite value to me. I have found it, and I want to tell you, the fallen world, all about Jesus. This is thanksgiving and joy that comes from our heart. And when it comes to obedience, all requests from God are welcome. Why? Because we love Him. And we know He'll take our filthy rags of righteousness and He'll wash our sins whiter than snow and He'll make our service wonderful in His sight. We love our God. We love Him. That is thanksgiving with joy in our hearts. The psalmist goes on and says, okay, now that you got a little bit of thanksgiving in your heart and you know what kingdom that you're serving, he goes on, he says this, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep ultimately of his pasture. I think this is beautiful and it's a profound and provocative statement the psalmist is trying to say. He's saying to keep our worship from becoming the exaltation of our own singing ability or the exaltation of our own passions. He's saying grateful praise must be grounded in the truth concerning ourselves and the truth concerning God. Let's deal with ourselves first. I think when we personify our sinful goals and passions upon a holy God, our worship becomes nothing more than a rootless gong and a clanging cymbal. Too many people go into the church and they have these great expectations and ideas of serving God and they go in and they sing beautiful songs, but they're singing for themselves. They're singing so other people will look at them and say, wow, you've got an amazing voice or wow, you've got great dedication or they read the Bible and they read so nicely or they, they give a prayer and you sit back and say, wow, it's eloquent. What beautiful speech and big words and theological you know, words that are massive. You must be a wonderful person of God. But that's not what God's looking for. He appreciates all of that, of course, but only if it's not focused on us, but focused on Him. You see, who we are, we must know in relation to Him. Knowledge is the mother of all devotion and of all obedience. Blind sacrifices, that especially ones that are focused on ourselves, will never please a holy God at all. To be, living, be a living sacrifice means one's personal worth is firmly grounded in God as our Creator. Being made in the image of God is very important to us, I would like to think. And it all because it means communication between us and God is natural and I think desirable. I like this picture I found on the internet here, and you have a, a picture of maybe what Adam kind of looked like when God said, I'm going to make you out of the dust of ground and then I'm going to breathe into you. I can only imagine what that must have been looked like as as God was forming Adam. 
but we are created in God's image. Our true self, I believe, is only known by the Spirit of God, who has gifted each and every Christian with spiritual gifts. And the wonderful part is he's given us the ability, his ability, to fulfill a divine role in the church. And that's awesome. That means when we go into the church and we try to do something for God, as long as we're doing it within our own spiritual gifting, nothing is impossible for us to do. What an honor it is for wretches like us to be asked to be the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ who sustains our very lives. Praise be, while we are jars of clay and we are very vulnerable, we're cared for by a sovereign God and we are untouchable. God, You know what? God loves us and Satan cannot touch us in any way, shape or form unless God gives him permission to do so. So praise be to God on thanksgiving God truly and wonderfully cares for us. The other thing I think we have to know, if we're going to praise God the right way, is that he is our shepherd. He's our shepherd. Not only did God make us, he bought us at the price of his very own son life. 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20. We do not worship God because he needs anything from us, his dependent creatures, Acts 17, 25, but out of love for and appreciation for all the green pastures he gives us, all the times he leads us beside still waters, for all the protection he constantly gives us, and let's not forget the eternal life that we're about to receive at the hands of Jesus Christ and we're going to spend an eternity with him. My goodness, there's a lot to be thankful for. He calls us by name. For he's grafted us, the Gentiles, into his vine through Christ's atonement. And he's taken the Jewish people and said, Look, I made a provision for you too as well in the same vine, through the same Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody is excluded from God's kingdom. It is through Christ that we have been delivered from the penalty of sin, which is called death. And I'm talking about spiritual death. Those who are no longer ashamed of the gospel but believe in Christ's atonement have eternal life with him and sovereign grace as their portion. That's awesome. Psalm 16, 5. Since nothing can cover a naked soul with the righteousness but the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise him because we work not for life, but we work because we have life. I don't work every Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, because I want life from Jesus, I work seven days a week because I got life from him. And if you can't be thankful for that, my goodness, he is your shepherd, and he leads and guides you, he'll make sure that you are safe in this world, he will love you, he'll never forsake you, he will always be with you, not just in this day and age, but the one to come. Oh my goodness, there's a lot to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. Enter his gates then with thanksgiving and his courts of praise. Give thanks to him and praise to his holy and wonderful name. What a nice passage. You know, verses 1 and 2 basically told us, you know, you can shout for joy. You know what? I don't care if you're Baptist. If you are, I happen to be Baptist. Uh, Shout for joy. You know what? Baptists don't normally do that, but shout for joy. If you're a Pentecost and you don't normally come into church shouting for joy, shout for joy. If you're a Roman Catholic and you don't normally come into the church and shout for joy, shout for joy. Whatever denomination you are, shout for joy because God is real. He exists and he loves you. Shout for joy is what the psalmist is saying. Shout for joy. And he's saying, come into his gates. Come into the church with thanksgiving in your hearts. Our worship is supposed to be done individually. Yes, we are supposed to read our Bible individually on our own and have special quiet time with Jesus. Absolutely. We're supposed to also go out into the field and meditate on his word. And we're supposed to fast and pray on our own. And there's great value in that. And God says, please do that. Jesus Christ many times, on many occasions, got alone all by himself and spent time with God the Father in heaven to give us an example of doing just that, solitude and prayer with him. But there's also many examples in the Bible, especially this one that says you've got to have thanksgiving in a community, in a community. He's revealed, what he's revealed in us, I think is a sufficient to spark faith and show us the way, the truth, and the life. And as a result, those who believe are no longer called servants, but we are called the very children of God. 
I know that living in North America, an abundance of blessings can make dependence on God difficult, but it does not have to be that way. We've got to learn how to praise God both in good and in bad times. We've got to learn to say, yes, Lord, I love you with all my heart. We've got to give God our best love, our warmest confidence, the sternest perseverance, the utmost self-denial, and we've got to enter his gates in his church with cheerful heart and thanksgiving. We are not called to worship God in isolation, but we're actually called, his elect people are called to come together and worship God with each other, build each other up in the faith, pick one out, another up when we fall down and love him so very much. We are called to rejoice in the Lord always. Paul says to the church of Philippi, again I say, rejoice. Let us not be like some of the people in this world that give up on the church and stop coming. Let's be those people that come into his gates with thanksgiving, into his church, his church that he died for, and say, yes, Lord, I'm all in. I want to help the people around me. I know so many people that have left the church because the world has taken them away. It might be sports, it might be work, it might be uh, boredom, it might be they just want to sleep in, but the world's taken them away from the church and they stay all by themselves and they worship God alone. And, and they say, I'm right, I'm in a good place and I don't need to come to church. And that's not scriptural. That's not what God says. God says, I sent my son to die for the church. Ultimately, Jesus said, Peter, I will build the foundation of the church upon you. And the gates of hell will not overcome the church I'm about to create. And it's going to be both Jew and Gentile. And you will build each other up in the faith. And praise be to God, you should be thankful that we live in North America. We could come into a church and worship his name in freedom. We should be thankful that we have one another. And we should praise God's wonderful name. For the Lord is good. And its love endures forever. His faithful con continues throughout all generations. Oh, amen to that. Thanksgiving is a holiday that should remind God's people to praise his holy, wonderful name. While the endless buffets of all-you-can-eat food and hugs from loved ones are certainly a lot to be thankful for, and certainly all the things that we have that we'll never possibly use, we should be thankful for that as well. I think first and foremost, we should be thankful that God exists and he loves us. That we should be thankful for the most. He is our creator. He's our redeemer. He loves us and he is faithful to us, not just now, but into eternity. Well, it might seem that his laws harm our freedom to do as we please. Who could once you have tasted God's love? Who could ever say to God, you know what? I don't want to follow your commands. I don't want to be holy. I don't want to get closer to you. I just want to do my own thing. I can tell you once you taste God's presence and his love in your heart, once you feel his presence and his joy, you'll never want to go back to the world. You'll want to stay dining at his table and feeling his presence. We want to be thankful that we can do that. His love, His mercy, His faithfulness to shepherd us, to provide for us, to protect us as a fountain that will never run dry. So let us, this day, shout to the Lord. To all the earth, let's give thanks. Our rock, our fortress, our eternal salvation is and always will be Jesus. Jesus. Will you not thank Jesus first today? before your meals, before your loved ones, will you not give him your very best? Because I can tell you, when Jesus hung on the cross, God gave us his very best, his own son. Will you not do the same for him? He wants to, for you to know him. He loves you so very much. He already knows you. But he wants you to know him. And that can only be done by giving him thanks and praising his name and spending time with him, not just alone, but in the community of the church. Will you do that? He is our God and we are his people. Praise be to God and thank him for all he's done. Amen.